Okay, let's make a deal. We're gonna talk about basic planning, the kind that lets us think about situations like bank runs without freaking out, because we know that even in the unlikely event that it does affect us, we have the right plan in place, we'll still be fine. So last week, Silicon Valley bank collapse came on really fast. And I doubt many of us watching this video are directly affected here, at least impacted beyond that FDIC insurance limit, $250,000. But it's something that all of us can learn from. This is the largest bank failure in the United States since the 2008 financial crisis. It's not a small thing. The bank though does cater to a pretty specific tech clientele and the entire industry has been struggling lately. So you don't need to assume that your bank is in the same boat but there are similar risks. So let's make a plan, it just seems practical. So let's just get out the part of what we're looking at here. We've all heard about bank runs, but for clarity, I'll just explain what happened to SVB. They were notified by Moody's that the bank's credit was about to be downgraded, and that downgrade was due really to the value of the bonds that SVB was holding. The value had fallen due to the rising interest rates. Now, I've been watching this story. I'm not an expert here. I'm just telling you what I saw. SVB sold $20 billion worth of its bonds. They took a $1.8 billion loss. And that sale and the loss signaled to customers that the bank was in trouble, spooked a lot of the customers. And those who could began withdrawing their deposits. That led to Friday's shutdown, something that's pretty alarming to a lot of people. Now, that final stage of what happened at SVB, that could really happen to any bank. The idea of a bank run is that a large number of customers get nervous and they withdraw their money all at once. Now, the worry there is that the bank could become insolvent, unable to return their deposits, so the customer's panic becomes self-fulfilling. They actually cause what they're hoping to avoid. Now, the reason this can happen in the first place is based on the way banks operate. Fractional reserve lending is probably something you've heard about. It allows banks to hold 10% of its deposits in reserve, leaving the remaining 90% available for the bank to loan out. So if customers rush to the bank to withdraw their funds, or a high number of customers default in their loans, or both, then the bank can't meet those demands. And if that makes you nervous, well, it made a lot of people nervous. And that's why the FDIC was introduced in 1933. They're there to act as a protection against that specific issue. So if a bank becomes insolvent, the FDI steps in, they secure the assets, and they repay depositors up to $250,000. Now, you're going to hear people warn you not to trust banks. Some will even tell you avoid them altogether. That seems to be the formula for a popular video around here, but you're not going to hear that from me. I think all of us are grown up enough to make the call on our own. Everybody's situation is different. Some are above that $250,000 FDIC guarantee. Some aren't. Some have all their bills being paid through their accounts, their payroll being automatically deposited, and more. Some don't. So there are certain things that only apply to you, and then there are two things that I think really apply to everybody. The first is that upper limit of the FDIC guarantee. It's $250,000 per depositor per bank. So you might want to consider how and where you keep your savings if you're above that mark. Now the second is your need for immediate access to cash, how much you might need. I talked to several people on Friday who had accounts at SVB frozen. It's kind of a scary thing. They expected to have some resolution at least on the FDIC insured levels by Monday, but we'll see. They were scrambling at the time to figure out payrolls and other immediate needs. That's a bigger issue than personal accounts, though. The idea, though, is the same. Would you have your recurring bills covered if your bank account got locked up for a week or more? That's something that you might want to think about. I think gold and silver play into this plan in a pretty significant way. I've always thought that it was smart to keep some cash on hand, but I wouldn't want to be my own bank, as so many people recommend. I would never want to keep hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash at my house. This wasn't a problem when I was in my 20s. It just wasn't an issue at all because I didn't have enough to worry about. But as you get older, your retirement savings come into play. Maybe you have a significant amount saved up. Do you want to keep that at your house? I don't think so. What I do think makes sense is having enough cash to cover immediate expenses. Maybe that's a month's worth, maybe it's two or three. And then I think that it makes sense to have gold and maybe silver stored somewhere that you could access it relatively quickly. Now that's the start of my plan, and I've had that plan long before the Silicon Valley bank closure. 
15 years before for counting, and the reason why is that this happened to other banks in 2008. Now, the second part of my plan, the specific part of it, is something that I talk about all the time. It's having the kind of gold and silver that I can very quickly sell. And there are a lot of ways to go about this. My personal plan is to have a base of one ounce American Gold Eagles and Buffaloes. That's what I'd sell down if I had to. I don't see a need for variety personally. I don't see a big need for smaller fractional gold. I don't see a big need for silver, but that's just me. That's my plan. Some of it, it's well hidden, it's close at hand, and some of it is vaulted in a depository. Your plan is whatever makes sense to you. You might see a need for fractional gold, maybe silver. You might like lower premium options. You might like pre-33. Now, I'm going to run through a few of these ideas quickly, the ones that I think make sense, and then I'm going to give a little bit of the thinking behind each of them. Now, realistically, this is all the same plan. They're just variables here. An option that I think is almost as good for me in my situation uh, the situation of buying eagles and buffaloes would be buying something like one ounce Canadian maple leaves, maybe Krugerrands, possibly Britannias. All three options are lower premium, but they're very well known and I could sell them all. In my location though, the eagles and buffaloes are considerably more popular, so that extra 1 or 2% buy premium on them would typically be covered in the sell side as well. I'd get back one or 2% over spot if I sold them. So it's really not a significant part of the plan. I could make it work with really four or five different coin options. The bigger part for me of this plan and the part that really doesn't matter from buying maples or eagles, buffaloes or Britannias is consistency. Now, I don't wanna have any question on that quick sale. I wanna have what the local dealers want and I wanna have as much of that as possible. My local dealers, they like maples, they like Krugs just fine. So all of those options would work. Now, another option would be to go heavy with fractional gold. I hear this recommendation a lot in the logic. It makes sense. It's that you wouldn't want to sell a $1,900 coin to buy groceries for the week. Again, that makes sense. If $500 will get you through that month, well, having quarter ounce coins might be smart. I think that that's the second biggest consideration for what you plan to stack. The first is what you wanna spend for each purchase in the first place. Quarter ounce, 10th ounce, they might simply be what you're most comfortable buying. And I don't care what anybody says about premium, you should stack what you're comfortable with. What I don't agree with is when people say that the population won't be able to afford the one ounce coins here in the United States. There have always been buyers for them. They have always been the most popular coin. So anyone telling you that is probably just making a guess. They probably don't know the market. And I would not want to be liquidating gold weekly. I look at it like, what would I need for a month? And since I don't want to have to sell any gold, really, I'm going to have cash available for smaller purchases. And between you and me, I'm going to need more than $500 to get my family through a month. Now, another option that plays off the idea of buying what you're comfortable with is buying what you like. Maybe you get bored with Eagles and Buffaloes, Krugs or Britannias. You need it to be more exciting than that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Typically, the people buying high premium fun coins, they probably have more discretionary income than the average person, so it's on them. And if they ever need to sell down quickly, if you ever need to sell down quickly, if this is you, you might not get more than spot. But you still have a backup option that most people simply do not. Now, if you hear me say eagles and buffaloes, you simply don't like them, totally fine. My advice here is just to call the local dealers, talk to them, and ask them to make sure that they'll buy what you have. Now, if they won't, or they won't give you what you think that they're worth, well, I showed a few weeks back that it is very easy to sell to online dealers here as well. You'll do better in a sale like that, but it's going to take longer. I had a quote on Monday, and I had the money in my account by Thursday. I think that's probably a best-case situation. Now, a subcategory of this might be pre-33, but these are very specific to local dealers. For some, they're just as popular as modern U.S. Mint Bullion, Eagles Buffaloes. For others, though, you have to know what you're getting into. That's the same advice to call around, ask your dealers what they're into. That definitely applies here. Now, the next is silver. I see the 10-ounce silver bar as a toss-up when compared to a one-tenth ounce gold coin. Premium to buy them, it's about the same. Liquidity, also about the same. If you like silver, you know, obviously go for it. You're not going to listen to me either way. But the same dealers that buy gold, they buy silver, so... It's really the same plan. The difference here though, is that if you're looking at needing to sell 10, 10 ounce bars at a time to get to that $2,000, I'll just say it. It's a lot easier to carry a single gold coin inconspicuously than it is to bring in 10 blocks of silver. 
seriously, if you have them, go grab 10 10 ounce bars and just walk them into the next room. Now below that size, I don't know how much faith I have in silver's usefulness. I like having American Silver Eagles. I've mentioned that several times and I could see potentially being able to use them directly in transactions. It's not nearly as likely as using something like cryptocurrency, but who knows? Now, I don't see broad acceptance of small silver. One ounce rounds, constitutional silver, all that just does not seem significant enough to me to cover the kinds of issues that a wide scale bank run would cause. But if it helps you sleep better at night, just like anything, go for it. Now, the final option would be to just buy whatever you find, whatever's cheap this week, whatever catches your eye next week, different sizes, different metals, sometimes baby Yoda, sometimes a holographic gold bar. And I'm sorry here, but to me, this just is not a plan. This is trying to address a possible issue without a plan. Again, you're going to be better off than someone with no backup whatsoever, but I just can't come up with a reason to do this. If you have one, great. If you don't, and you're watching these videos to try to come up with your own plan, well, I would say that anything that I've mentioned prior to this, prior to just buying whatever you run across, is going to be better. Uh, two is one, one is none. That's a planning mantra. That's what this whole channel is about, so this shouldn't really be a surprise. I think having a plan is important. Now, normally I'd walk this back a little bit, in case you're doing it, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but we're talking about planning for an unexpected issue that you might need to react to immediately, and a uniform plan beats chaos any day. Now, there's more to this topic. It's one that I think involves more than cash and metals. I could even give a strong case for cryptocurrency here, but I probably need more time to make that case. And it's really something that I'm not arguing for. Now, if you can find a way to get some cash socked away at home to get three ounces of easily liquidated gold, I would say that you're well on your way. That's a three month contingency for a lot of people. Now my contingency, it's two years. You don't have to stop, that's up to you, but you really should think about this stuff. Banks can get shut down. I would say that your goal should be to try to keep that from shutting you down too. So that's it for this one. Let us know what you think here, whether you have a backup plan in place or maybe you're working on it. Hopefully nobody's scrambling and hopefully SVB didn't impact you directly. I have some friends that are pretty stressed out at the moment. Hope you're all fine. Let us know. And then while you're in the comments, be sure to hit that like button if you found any of this interesting. Be sure you're subscribed with notifications turned on if you'd like to hear more on the topic. And if you're still here, thanks again for watching. I always appreciate your time. Take care.